Martyr Monday, and we're talking about the story of St. Mark. <laughs> Chapter 1. Uh, little is known about Mark in the Gospels. Uh, in fact, we have two indications that Mark is mentioned there without being named. The first is that Mark is the boy who carries the water and finds the upper room, the place where Jesus would gather together with his apostles uh, for the Last Supper, uh, for the communion and the giving of the New Testament of his blood. In fact, some people say, and this is a, there's no reason to doubt it, in fact, that that home where the upper room was, was the home of Mary, the mother of Mark. We also think that perhaps Mark was the boy who fled from the Garden of Gethsemane. Who, so he had gone from the house with the disciples of Jesus to the garden and were gathered there when Jesus took Peter, James, and John off to pray. When the soldiers came, uh, they grabbed a hold of this kid by the linen cloth, but he ran away and ran away naked. That that is, in fact, uh, a Saint Mark who would write the second gospel. Chapter 2. The real biblical history of St. Mark begins in Acts chapter 13. Barnabas, whose name means the encourager, in fact, maybe it's a title, Barnabas uh, was the cousin of St. Mark, and Barnabas is the one who found St. Paul, brought him into the life of the church, and in fact, there uh, from the church at Antioch has made arrangements for him and Paul to take a missionary journey, to take the gospel of Christ out into the pagan and Gentile world. So they go down to the coast and they take Mark, or John, as he's also called, they take him with them to be an assistant or a helper. So they go down to the coast and they sail across to Cyprus. They sail from Cyprus north into the southeast coast of Asia. And there in chapter Acts chapter 13, they arrive in Pisidia. And it says, When Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. That's Acts 13, verse 13. Now, it doesn't tell us why. It doesn't tell us what motivated Mark, why he left them. If it was fear, if he had other things to do, if he was homesick, if he was weary, if his faith was weak. It doesn't tell us. It just says that they left. He left them uh, there. Well, Paul and Barnabas continue, and, and we lose track of Mark until uh, Paul and Barnabas catch back up with him in Jerusalem. In fact, Acts chapter 15 is one of these very important chapters in the book of the Bible where all the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, James, Peter, uh, James is dead by now, Peter uh, and the other James have gathered down in Jerusalem and the uh, James is bishop there now. I, I got it. There's two Jameses. Anyhow, uh, some of you are saying, hey, there's three Jameses. Take it easy. Two Jameses. Anyhow, uh, they're down in, in Jerusalem and they're duking it out over the Gentile problem. They're trying to figure out how these pagans can become Christians. And, and Mark joins them back up there. And Mark goes with Paul and Barnabas back up to Antioch. And now they're getting ready for their second missionary journey. And Barnabas says, let's take Mark. And Paul says, no way. Absolutely not. And this hu in Acts chapter 15, this big fight breaks out between Barnabas and Paul over Mark. And so uh, sharp is the dispute that Paul and Barnabas split ways. And Barnabas goes with Mark back to Cyprus and then up to the south, They're retracing and visiting the churches that they started. And Paul goes up the northern way. Chapter 2, part 2, I've got a theory. Now don't this is just my own thinking. But look, here is the first missionary journey where they leave from Antioch, and they sail across to Cyprus. They come up to Perga, and that's where Mark leaves. He comes back to Antioch. While Paul and Barnabas go and visit these churches, they go to uh, Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Derby, and then they, they go back around this way. Now, here is the second missionary journey. And look at this. So, so Barnabas leaves Antioch, and he goes back to visit the same churches where they were before. Paul, on the other hand, goes and sees Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and Pisidia. And then instead of going back down to the coast, down to Perga, he heads this direction over to Troas. Now, th this is my theory, is that so uh, Paul does not want to see Mark. And so when it goes down here where they would have run into each other, he says, forget it. We're going the other direction. Chapter 3. 
We don't know what happens with Mark. In fact, we lose uh, track of him, and he's not mentioned again in the book of Acts. But he is mentioned in other places in the Bible. And in fact, in in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, at the very end, like verse uh, 13, Peter greets Mary, the mother of Mark, and talks about how Mark uh, is, so, uh, is beloved by Peter. And the tradition of the church tells us that St. Mark paired up with Peter and went with Peter to Rome. And there, when Peter was in prison in Rome, that Mark was writing down his preaching, and that's where he composed the Gospel of Mark. In fact, the Gospel of Mark is often called the Gospel of Peter. And it's understood to have Peter's apostolic authority connected to it. So, so Mark and Peter become partners in the Gospel, and that's how the Gospel was written. Really quite glorious. Chapter 4. At some point, Mark and Paul reconcile. And we have three indications of this in the scriptures because, because Paul will write of Mark. The first is in Colossians. I gotta look at the text here, where Paul writes about how uh, Colossians 4, verse 10, and Paul includes Mark among the few of the circumcision, that is, of Jewish origin, who labored with him and provided some comfort. It seems like Mark was chosen by uh, by by Paul to be his representative in Colossae. Then in Philemon verse uh, 24, there's only one chapter, just verse 24, uh, he calls Mark his fellow worker. And then perhaps most beautiful of all, the last of Paul's writings, uh, he writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.11, and he says, send Mark because he is very useful to me. So 10 years, this dispute is there, but it seems like these two reconciled and Paul and Mark are working together, and in fact, Mark has become very useful, not only to, uh, to Paul, but also to the entire church. Chapter 5. We lose track now of the biblical history and have to go to tradition. Eusebius writes uh, that Mark was the first who was sent to Egypt, and he proclaimed the gospel which he had written and established churches in Alexandria. In fact, tradition then tells us that Mark became the bishop of the church in Alexandria and under the persecution of Nero, that Mark himself was arrested, that he was tied with ropes, and that they pulled Mark with these ropes into the fire where he was burned. The church collected his bones. Uh, he suffered then the great martyrdom that so many of the Lord's apostles and those first Christians suffered under the persecution of the pagan Romans. But even though Mark died, his words, in fact, his doctrine lives on in the gospel that he left for the church. And in fact, we should say clearly that he lives on uh, as one of those souls, one of the martyrs that are under the altar that Revelation shows us, crying out, how long, O Lord, how long? Chapter 6. The gospel of Mark, of course, is a beautiful comfort for Christians. It gives us the story of Jesus. And it's been often noted that the Gospel of Mark has this kind of hurried pace to it. Immediately, immediately it goes like this. That it go, Jesus is rushing around from one place or another and at last rushing to the cross to die for sinners. So we'll finish this story of St. Mark with his texts, with the words that he wrote. In fact, with the words of Jesus that he preserved for us. So starting in the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, verse 41. When the ten heard it, they became greatly displeased with James and John, who had asked if they could sit on the right and left hand of Jesus in his kingdom. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be the first shall be the slave of all. And these words, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. As hard as it is to believe that Jesus, the Lord of all, did not come to be the Lord and Master and have us as his servants, but rather he came to serve, we are given this glorious truth in the text of the Scriptures. Jesus says to the disciples, I did not come to be served. I came to serve. And Jesus says that same exact thing to us. He does not come to us so that we might serve him. But he comes to us to serve us, to give his life for us, 
to bless us, to forgive us, to redeem us, to rescue us, to forgive us all of our sins. So much of Christianity, so much of Christi Christian preaching and Christian talk is about how, how, how we have to serve Jesus. But these words of Jesus from Mark rebuke that idea and remind us that Jesus is the one who serves. He, his delight is to serve you. So we rejoice, just as Mark did, in being served by Jesus, blessed by him, and forgiven all of our sins in his name. And that's the story of St. Mark. I'm Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. Thanks for watching this Martyr Monday. My expert YouTube advisor, Daniel, said, Dad, you got to put a subscribe button on the video. You got to put a button on there so people can click it and subscribe. So I'm going to, I'm going to try. We'll, we'll see how that goes. You guys still here? You just click the button and then watch the next video.